On the 20th of July 1969, the Apollo 11 mission lands on the moon. Neil Armstrong and, and Buzz Aldrin are the first human beings to touch the ground of the moon. Now, the entire space race during the Cold War was largely debated and discussed. And it still generates stories nowadays, right? It's almost 60 years later. So if you go on, like, on YouTube or any social media, you can find plenty of conspiracy theories still talking about the moon landing. But all these discourses throughout the time were, were very influential. They were not uh, separate or detached from the actual event, from the event of, of landing of, on the moon. They were part of it. They were part of the space race. The entire space race during the Cold War was made of announcements that were sort of describing the challenges between Russia and the United States. And those uh, stories uh, about landing on the moon were far more important than the actual landing on the moon. The space race during the Cold War had a tremendous geopolitical impact. It changed the influence and credibility of the United States, for instance. Pointing at the moon uh, was far more important than actually landing on the moon. And pointing at the moon, or rather to Mars and uh, other planets that are in, in outer space, is still very important nowadays. But we no longer have Jeff Kennedy, we have uh, Elon Musk, uh, Jeff Bezos, and, and others. So there is a new privatized space race going on at the moment. The geopolitical concern is not as prominent as it was with before. This is uh, very much uh, centered geographically in the Silicon Valley. It's a movement that celebrates private entrepreneurship, uh, which embraces and expands the Californian ideology, and that sees the challenge between private investors and public institutions as one of its ultimate objectives. So the new space race is not exactly and just a continuation of what NASA was doing in the 60s. It is similar, but it's also radically different. This is a project to occupy the same position of authority that NASA and the US were occupying back in 1969. The authority to move humankind, to bring humankind towards the next age, become, as they say very often, a multi-planetary space-faring civilization. And they're not gonna save us from uh, communism or nuclear war. Uh, this time is more like six, the sixth mass extinction or, or climate change. Um, and as they negotiate their political and cultural power against public institutions, they also, at the same time, draw on structures that are still very much publicly funded. For instance, uh, uh, infrastructure, lo uh, infrastructure for launch stations or for logistics, or higher education institutions for uh, engineers and, and so on. And they do everything they can to gain visibility as the principal leaders of the new movement in order to attract always new capitals. The conclusion that we have uh, reached uh, during our research is that this new movement for privatized space colonization is of very little interest for its aspirations and what they actually promise, but it's much more relevant for what it does now at the present on planet Earth. And as it appears evident when you start spending time listening to what Elon Musk and others are saying, and also uh, paying attention to when they talk, uh, the timing of their announcements, when they tweet, um, how they stage their launches, their experiments, even how they talk about their failures, you can see that their primary goal is to have an impact on the present. So for this reason, we think of these discursive performances as a slight event, the sort of tricks that a magician will do in order to distract the audience. Uh, something they will do with one end uh, in order to, not, to make you uh, not look at what they are doing with the other end. These are discursive performances that mobilize capitals and investment, but they're also supposed to distract the, the audiences. So, of course, you can say it with the famous proverb uh, attributed to Confucius, uh, when a wise man points to the moon, an idiot looks at his finger. Only on this occasion, it's probably the, the wisest thing to do, is precisely to look at the finger. Such a movement is often called and referred to as the new space movement. So what is the new space? So after 1969, funding towards NASA dropped. 
the peak had a, as a, was already reached, actually, uh, towards the end of the 60s. Public interest collapsed. State intervention was not so much interested in air, aerospace projects of this kind. So as a result, uh, a new kind of movement emerged, what uh, Michael Michaud, for instance, calls the pro-space movement. A new movement of private investors that were trying to experiment with uh, a similar projects. So through the 90s and early 2000s, a number of privates were trying to start small and medium-sized projects, uh, medium-budget projects. They were not really comparable to what NASA or Russia were doing until uh, not long ago. It is only in the early 2010s that we see a number of companies declaring that the age of state-funded space travel will soon be replaced by privately funded projects. SpaceX, the company uh, by Elon Musk, presented itself precisely in this manner. On the, in 2016, SpaceX picked the Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A to launch their new Falcon Heavy, a new uh, rocket. It, there was the exact same station from where the Apollo 11 uh, um, rocket was launched in 1969 to land on the moon. It was a symbolic gesture uh, which, which was made to, to declare in the, quote, the end of government's monopoly on space travel. The contemporary new space movement produces symbolic gestures and also, of course, as you probably know, an endless flow of tweets and announcements and press releases. And they do so to occupy that position of authority from where new space adventurers uh, can achieve a number of objectives in the present on planet Earth. So such slides of end, as Paolo said. So what are they trying to achieve? Well, one of the most evident outcomes uh, when you start looking at the finger, and not at Mars, not at the moon, is the importance given to the stock exchange value of the companies working in new space. So most of the announcements and tweets uh, released by the main actors of the new space movement uh, kind of involved in this movement are, are times so that they can have positive effect, maximize the positive effect uh, on the value of their companies. So from this perspective, uh, new space stocks can be considered uh, growth stocks. So meaning that these companies are evaluated uh, not so much on their actual worth right now, so number of employees, offices, uh, sales, all those things, but more for the perceived potential of those companies. So their value is based on the potential to overcome the overall market value over time. So value stocks usually are, are companies trading below what they're really worth right now, right? But growth over value is the general approach driving the stock market around new space, uh, which explains the reason why the major companies compete not only to sort of take over the market, but also to take over our imagination, and more importantly, the imagination of investors, uh, constantly showing off, showing off their potential. This is also reflected at the bottom level. So there is a, an explosion of Silicon Valley companies uh, and, and startups that kind of emerge and base their objective in, spe in specializing on a specific R&D area of new space and um, so that their stock can be sold and kind of investor can be interested uh, before actually maybe achieving space colonization. It's also interesting to see how the new space movement uses space itself as the sort of perfect metaphor for this growth over value strategy. So this is taken from the new space capital. Uh, it's one of the, the main sort of um, private equity group within new space. And uh, in this kind of, we can read that they define uh, space as the final Im investment frontier, but they actually say space is infinite. So to consider it as a final frontier is misleading. It's actually more appropriate to define it as an infinite series of frontiers. And the farther away from Earth the frontiers will be, the longer their commercial value will take, the, 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 the commercial development and, and therefore arriving to value will take, which offers a, a tremendous growth opportunities for investors, right? And so this particular sort of approach uh, uh, to entrepreneurship uh, requires unlimited resources. So growth can be attractive uh, only uh, to investor, only if it's expected to happen, right? So if the stocks are expected to be sold at a higher price later. So um, as it would happen, for example, in cryptocurrency, uh, the new space requires expansions without boundaries of material limits. 
and the universe is the perfect place, right? The perfect metaphor to overcome Earth material limits. So new space can be also seen as the epitome of a, of a renaissance of a certain type of capitalism, which is frictionless capitalism. So in the early 90s, uh, digital economies gave the illusion that capitalism uh, would enter a new cycle of continuous growth. So finally, immaterial production uh, doesn't know the limits of uh, the, the material constraint that come with uh, the cycles of crisis. So people like Bill Gates were extremely vocal about frictionless capitalism. Um, we, of course, now know that this is complete and utter bullshit, right? So no one ever since the dot-com bubble uh, could ignore the limits of such a worldview, right? But now, in an age that sort of follows that kind of dot-com bubble burst uh, and the financial crash of 2008, and the fears of a six max a mass extinction, sort of the new space kind of comes back with the promise of, of infinite expansion. So, uh, but just to do it elsewhere, not on planet Earth, but in a place that, if, that is free from history, uh, like the title of the, of the video, uh, the artwork that uh, Axioma kind of um, produced for us. And uh, there is no jurisdiction, there is no opposing forces. Um, so it's also interesting, we're kind of obsessed with the languages of, of, of new space, of course, and kind of looking at those diagrams, you sort of, um, those are some of the diagrams that are used to describe um, tra new space trajectories and they're incredibly similar to the ones used to describe um, the continuous growth of companies such as Amazon. So once again, space uh, with its orbital and sort of cyclical uh, trajectories becomes the perfect metaphor for, for, for late capitalism. And in many of the new space company renderings as well, uh, space is presented as a kind of frictionless vacuum, right? Uh, a vacuum that can safely uh, be traveled by goods and people uh, and allow us to loop goods and people between different planets and, and, and Earth. And the problem is that, uh, you know, it's not just a long distance, it's about 374 million uh, kilometers but it also actually has a number of obstacles in its way, from the space junk of lower orbit, to the solar radiation to which the, the astronauts are gonna be exposed to, to the whole time. The, in the, uh, they can create a lot of problems in the long run. Uh, the fact that our skeleton systems cannot support and, and tolerate such prolonged exposition to low gravity. The fact that the Mars dust in particular is, is particularly radioactive. And of course, kind of a, a lot of those frictions again, have been sort of conveniently removed from, from sort of these visions, these future visions. So new space um, requires us to move the horizon of expansion always a little bit further. So, and believe that space is the ideal context for this, right? So, but, but those, the colonization of space, the, 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 the space where those visions take place at the moment is entirely fictional. You know, uh, and, and, and it's because it's, it's, it's entirely fictional. So no one has extracted any resource from, from Mars yet that they are so interesting. So, um, you know, those, those planets and those other worlds are, are depicted as elsewhere, as other from Earth. And this is a sort of return, this allows a sort of return to a certain type of colonialist language, a certain type of colonial, colonialist imagination that, that uh, the sort of is deprived of natural and cultural uh, conf conflicts and frictions. This also allows the return of rhetoric of war and quite violent language that would be completely uh, unacceptable here on planet Earth, but it is completely acceptable in these fictional worlds, like the idea of Elon Musk of actually nuking Mars and to, and to use several nukes on the poles to raise the, the, the temperature in order to be able to terraform the planet quicker. But the process itself of getting into space is also aligned with the sort of anthropocentric views of progress on domestication. So since the first uh, space exploration experiments, uh, several animals were actually sent into space. For instance, the, the famous dog Laika, which was sent by the Soviet Union space program in uh, 1957. All of the animals died in the experiments. And so this sort of unchallenged exploitation of resources is something that is rooted into space exploration since its infancy. 
But what's in, is different in the new space is that even though those same anthropocentric views are still at the core of new space, you know, the, a lot of the rhetorics that we see coming from the CEOs of the Silicon Valley appeal to the fear of the sort of general public fear of, of climate catastrophes um, and climate change. So the, the proponents of new space kind of want to take us to the stars to save our planet. And yet in the process, natural and cultural resources are seen as expendable. This is also true here on planet Earth, where, for example, uh, America's private, private space uh, enterprises are building rocket uh, launch bases in the Amazon forest in Brazil, which could mean the eviction of uh, thousands of descendants of native communities and the disruption of quite vital um, ecosystems. A lot of these narratives that the new space movement is, is using have already failed in the past, right? So we have unlimited growth, we have uh, the control of foreign uh, territories, we have imaginaries of frictionless uh, expansion, but the new space is something different, for now at least. Um, it, it ultimately, its appeal is that all of these narratives will never have to confront with the harsh reality as they did in the past, or at least not so quick. A lot of the renderings of, of, of uh, imagining our travel to Mars um, sort of, the, the, again, kind of simplify uh, some of the challenges. And uh, one of the biggest challenges kind of that is being referred to is around uh, duration. We have already seen how um, kind of some of the challenges are much higher. And there are a lot of kind of um, the independent scientific reports that, that are starting to emerge challenging some of those visions. And so the, the important thing to understand about the new space movement is that as a, as a financial investment movement, uh, in, in some way there is no need to confront um, the investment plans with some of those issues, with some of those problems. Because the, the, the people investing in those, in, the, in, those, uh, in those companies are going to be able to sell stocks before some of those visions uh, will actualize. So you might remember uh, John F. Kennedy Kennedy famous quote, you know, uh, we choose to go to the moon because it's hard, not because it's easy. We argue that in a way, kind of Elon Musk and other new space proponent choose to do all of this because it's easy, not because it's hard. Because it's not really about getting there. It's about creating powerful, uh, impactful narratives that can have an impact right now, again, on, on the stock exchange value of some of those companies. The point for us is, is that we can say the same for ourselves. So we do it because why are we working uh, and thinking and trying to produce new works uh, about new space? Well, we do it because it's easy. But still, why? Because being the lazy bastard that we are, uh, we found in the new space movement an almost endless repositories of, repository of bullshit of weird characters who are full of themselves. So most of the time, when we read material produced by these companies and released to investors, um, it's stuff that you couldn't possibly make up. So it's easier even to, to use, just to give you uh, an example. Here are some uh, quotes from the CEOs uh, involved, involved in the new space movement. So as you can see, there is uh, a lot of stuff here. Uh, we also used some of these quotes in uh, the, um, the karaoke songs and the videos that uh, are exhibited now uh, at, uh, at Axioma. Well, there, there's plenty of things like uh, going to space to benefit Earth. This is more or less what, we're, what Filippo was uh, explaining before, so that kind of rhetoric. Um, to the moon to stay, uh, leader in apocalypse technology, or even some strange uh, new <laughs> term like astropreneurship. I don't, I, I don't think, uh, I, I'm, I think I'm not even able to pronounce it. Um, so, as, the, as you can see, reading around, um, there is a, a clear visionary uh, attitude behind it uh, and behind the statements, and even a, a clear uh, rhetoric. Um, so, from our point of view, 
the, the crucial point in the story is that most of the bombastic statements of these seals uh, and most of these uh, promises somehow alre are already failing in the very moment they are told. Or at the opposite, and, and especially when talking about new space, we are not going to live long enough uh, to see if they will actually take place or not. So as a group of artists, what we keep asking ourselves is what we can do with these uh, failed promises, with these failed narratives. And basically what we do is to use these failed promises uh, as a source material, basically. And we are interested in finding new ways of using the leftovers of these failures, uh, the traces produced and left on planet Earth about this uh, perspective. So, uh, most of the time, when explaining the main point uh, in, uh, um, in our research, uh, artistic research, we try to use this uh, metaphor uh, in which we um, think of ourselves as if being DJs at the party, but DJs who are already, uh, in a way, feeling the engover of the same party. So, these DJs with an headache. Um, have the, I would say, the, the imperative to keep the, the music going, so to keep the, the show going in a way, while knowing that surely everyone will leave and go in different direction at the very end of the party. And doing art in such a context that we call post-fail uh, means asking ourselves the question of what music is appropriate to uh, play in such a context how to respect uh, one's own um, headache while still try to give a, an interesting and possibly enjoyable experience. So this is the approach that a few years ago uh, we started to call post-fail. So post-fail for us means doing art after failure, so after the knowledge, uh, the knowledge of these failures. Uh, so art uh, that are fought and uh, produced after, again, acknowledging the inevitable failure of all promises made uh, around the future, and while looking at the miserable material left when everyone else is gone. So what can we do with this stuff? So throughout our work, we have been focusing on how narrative about uh, the future leave traces on the present our promises of future uh, where we are all hyper-connected, augmented, living in smart homes, and smart cities, uh, tend to disappoint in a way and leave ground to more banal realities. And at the same time, uh, how, and only for the fact of being told, these narratives change our ways of living and thinking in the present time. Um, and what kind of stuff they produce and leave, uh, and leave to us for our use. Just to give you an example, some years ago there was a great talking about drones and how they were said uh, and expected to revolutionize several aspects of our, aspects of our everyday life, like, like uh, I don't know, from logistics to home delivery and, and, and so on. Uh, but then actually they ended up to be used mainly by hobbyists and then of course video makers and photographers. So we decided to imagine the life of a drone as if it was free in a way to decide what to do in its, and with its own life and its own free time. So what would a drone do and how? In this photographic series, we imagine, for example, that a drone uh, would have pointed the camera towards a, um, a mirror uh, just for taking a selfie of itself. We are also particularly interested in the words used to point at this future. So what are the phrases? What, are, what, are, what, what is the language? Uh, the language used to describe um, these perspectives. And uh, within, um, within this, uh, within this mean, we include verbal language, but also text, um, written text, and uh, bodily language. And uh, from our point of view, this is a, um, this is a work. It's actually a, a video performance presented as a, an installation. It's a work from 2018 called Launching a New Product. And uh, I'm kind of stressing the, the title because it's part of, uh, of the point that I want to make. 
so the, the fact that we like to play even with the language, with the words, what, what you have seen was the four of us just launching a, a product on, on a field covered with snow, and uh, then the box lands on the table where a, a pair of fans open it, and start to, to touch and show it to the camera. Uh, so the video was inspired by the internet phenomenon of un unboxing and uh, as well as uh, ASMR um, fetishism in a way. So what we did here was transforming and using the language in its multiple meanings uh, and the rhetorics, be rhetorics behind it and the narratives that uh, this kind of language fosters um, and transform it into a performance that play with all these elements, try to, trying to recombine them in a different manner that in a way represent our own view on, uh, uh, and our own take on, on, on these topics. We're also uh, interested in, uh, in failures mainly, uh, and especially how uh, realities fail to cope with the promises made around them. Uh, and our predictions fail, our projects fail, our expectations fail. So that's the, the kind of thing that interests us the most. And again, this is another example. Uh, it's a work uh, that we started in 2012 called the First Viewer Television. And to us, it represents the failure of one of the most prominent promises, promises uh, brought by YouTube. The, so the idea of broadca broadcasting yourself, that somehow implies uh, that everyone of us have had the opportunity to not only to upload stuff and videos on YouTube, but also to have a, um, an audience willing to listen or, or watch to what we have to, to show, to talk to them. Um, However, this is not true at all. So the, the fact that uh, we can uh, upload stuff on YouTube, uh, it, it doesn't mean that we have an audience ready to, um, to follow us. Uh, First Via Television was an online streaming of zero views videos. So basically, um, you, when watching this TV, TV, you were the very first um, person uh, watching these videos. Uh, so videos that goes unnoticed are actually the biggest part of YouTube database. And it is exactly through these lenses, so these few points that I, uh, I made, uh, that we watch at new space, uh, looking for and working with the failures of all the promises that are on the table. So let's start with uh, Fortune Teller, one of the work uh, that probably is most uh, inspired to the language. And there are some of the slogans that Matteo showed before printed on it. So, uh, in this series of, of images, uh, we repropose the iconographic, iconographic tradition of the fortune teller. In this series, we repropose the iconogra iconographic tradition of the fortune teller in the frame of the space colonialism and in the frame of the new space movement. The fortune teller are often uh, foretelling the future by reading the palm of an end. On the other side, uh, in the talk and pitches, the space entrepreneurs are often picturing invisible space shift. They are often indicating visible planets, pointing and distant uh, horizons, uh, sharing a transhumanist utopia, or even detaching themselves from the human body they live in. Uh, in this series, we have represented disembodied end landing on Mars, caught in a frozen state while gesticulating as what I'm doing, just to click name pointing and uh, invisible futures. Recurring buzzwords and slogans predicted by the new space movement are displayed on the texture of the 3D models as a premonition of an imminent future colonization of other planets and, uh, and galaxies. Those are some of the images. This work and this research that, as you see, it's not a research just about uh, the language of uh, of uh, the written language and the slogans, but also the gesture and uh, the hands particularly. And this research behind the fortune teller uh, brought us to this video that's called Pointing at a New Planet. It is uh, a video loop animation of uh, the hand of Elon Musk flying over the surface of Mars. The video is presented with a karaoke song and an, anim an animated text in overlay. The song is composed uh, and sung by Albertina Sargas, and she's a, Berlin, um, a singer from Berlin. And the lyrics are a collage of uh, the most bombastic statements and slogan 
of the new space uh, company. Actually, in this case, are uh, just uh, Elon Musk uh, quotes from, uh, uh, from his promotion material from Twitter and, and so on. So let's have a look at this video. Humans must prioritize the colonization of Mars. It's not going to be some escape hatch for rich people. It's gonna be difficult, dangerous. Good chances you'll die. Excitement for those who survive. But hey, plenty of Mars behinds. Science fiction sometimes comes true. The big fucking rocket is making people excited about the future. Become a spacefaring multi planet civilization. We need to extend life beyond Earth as quickly as we can. Moon, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, throughout the solar system and beyond. That's the incredibly exciting future that we want. Science fiction sometimes comes true. The big fucking rocket is making people excited about the future. This video will be present, by the way, at the Axioma exhibition. And in the sixth exhibition, you will find also this video that is called Free From History. And it is the video that has been produced by Axioma. And it is the continuation of uh, pointing at a new planet. In this video, uh, the hand that previously was flying over Mars, now this hand is landing off the surface of a new planet. It has changed it, uh, its ecosystem. It has adapted the atmosphere and the ecology of the planet to its needs. It has created even a colony. It is able to start agriculture on a soil made mostly, made, uh, mostly uh, of rocks. It even has its own roller coaster. Um, the new planet becomes an entertainment park where to continue the capitalistic speculation no longer possible on planet Earth. Space has become an integral part of our everyday life. Now it's a critical factor in the growth of the global economy. It spans across multiple markets on Earth and beyond. From the investment perspective, it has unlimited potential. It's a new horizon. It's a new risk return profile. New space industry segments that constantly grow in importance. Invest in the biggest opportunity of our galaxy. Space holds the key and it's free from history. It is the final investment frontier. We 
we foster innovation and boost profitability. High levels of private funding, advances in technology. Oh, baby, a growing public sector interest is renewing the call. To look towards the stars, new frontiers to explore. The biggest companies and future leaders addressing multiple vertical ch -ch 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 challenges. Invest in a biggest opportunity of our galaxy. Space holds the key and is free from history. It is the fourth industrial revolution. <laughs> And the last work that I'm going to show is called Planet X, and it is a sculpture uh, made of two sections. On the bottom part, you see the green part there, there is a, a, a geodesic dome. The geodome is an architectural model theorized by Buckminster Fuller in the 50s and later interpreted by the Silicon Valley as an early symbol of the internet. Uh, on a geodome, each dome is part of a network. It equally supports the whole structure and has the same importance than any other node. That is pretty much the opposite of uh, what the internet has become. And for us it's particularly interesting to note how this model is used now in the 3D renderings representing the human, the human settlement on Mars, this one, for example, and how it connects the failed idea of the utopian project supporting the internet and the new space uh, propaganda of, of our age. It is interesting for us to note those, this connect, connection point between uh, symbologies. On the upper part of, of the sculpture, there is a surface representing the, the regolith. You see this part here. The regolith is it's a generic term that is becoming in age with, with, uh, with the new space. It is basically uh, whatever that lies on the ground, stone, sand, whatever. And basically, we, we use uh, 3D models of the, the regolith collected by the rovers uh, of the NASA that can be found online, as many other things uh, from the NASA uh, website. And uh, it is covered with a, with a glass that resembles a bit uh, a crystal glass to look uh, in the future. Thank you very much for your time and attention.